Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. All right, today we're going to take a look at Stockpile from Nauvoo Games. Uh, now, as the name implies, well, you might actually think that this game is about hoarding in a post-apocalyptic future, but while that might be a cool idea, it is not. This is actually about uh, stocks and uh, selling stocks and buying stocks and getting the most money and value out of your stocks. Wait, stop, don't, don't, don't run away and turn off the screen. I promise you it's more interesting than that sounds, <laughs> okay? Let's go ahead and take a brief look at how the game is played, then we're gonna come back, I'll let you know what I think. All right, this is the setup for a normal game of Stockpile. The goal of the game is to have the most money by the end of however many rounds of play is determined by the number of players. So you'll have a little round tracker up here, which is like a ledger book, and it will tell you for three players, you play seven rounds, for two to four players, you play six rounds, and for eight or two or four players, I should say, and four or five players, you're gonna play five rounds at the end of that amount of rounds. Whoever has the most money is gonna be the winner. Now you have these money cards here, and each player is gonna start off with 20,000, unless you're starting with one of the variants. And uh, there's money in different denominations, these little Hobbit cards. It actually works pretty well, though. I'll talk about that in my final thoughts. So you'll get your starting money. You also have your own player board. And on the player board, there's two different areas of note. You have the place where you keep your normal stocks. And at the beginning of the game, you're going to start off with one share. Uh, that's what these are, the share cards of all six different types of stock that are in the game. You have, let me hold them up the right way, Stanford Steel and Bottom Line Bank and Leading Laboratories, Cosmic Computers, American Automotive, and Epic Electric. Uh, so you'll have those six starting ones. You always keep them face down on your board. You only have to reveal them whenever you have to prove that you have a certain type of uh, share of stock in order to gain money for it. So you'll have your normal ones. You'll keep them on your normal side of your board. If a stock splits, which I'll cover later, then you keep them on this side of the board. Each player is also going to get a meeple. If you're playing a two-player game, you'll actually have two meeples for both players. So use the blue and the red ones. But normally it's just one. And this is going to be used during the... Uh, the phase, the demand phase, where you're actually trying to get uh, piles of cards, uh, more shares of stock. Other areas of note, we'll take a look at the board a little bit closer. Uh, over here, we have the actual six stocks and where they're tracking right now. This is how much money they're actually paying out at the given point. They're always going to start off in the middle here on the five spot, but during the course of the game, they may be moving up or down. Um, if it ever goes all the way down uh, to the trash can symbol, that, of course, means that it has gone bankrupt. And at that point, uh, if you have any shares of that stock, they're gone. You immediately have to discard them into the main stockpile. By the way, this is the main deck of cards, and I'll get back to whatever uh, the other type of cards that are in there as well and then it's after it goes bankrupt and you just screw your cards it resets back to its starting position however it could also go in the other direction and go all the way up to past the 10 mark to the point where it actually splits and when it splits then you get to take all the stock that you have of that particular or all the shares of that particular stock and then put them into your split pile like i described before on the other side of your board what that means is that those stocks are now going to be worth twice what they were before you get to sell them for twice the amount of uh, the numbers on the board represent how much you can sell the stock for at that given point and if it splits you can sell it for twice that amount and also whenever it pays out dividends which i'll get back to in a minute much like a lot, a lot of this uh, it will pay out double the amount as well when a stock splits it actually goes back to not to this original starting spot but to the hexagonal spot here and then it will continue to rise again and then if it splits again you just get a payout of i believe ten thousand for each of your stocks so it could be a really really good thing to have your stock split now over on this side we have the forecast cards there's two types of forecast cards there's uh, six forecast cards that correspond to each of the six different types of stock and then there are the forecast cards that tell you how that stock is going to do uh, during the end at the end of the round. It's either going to go down or it could potentially, well, also go more down. But I assure you there are also cards that will make it go up as well. And these are going to be randomly distributed so that each player has one of the, uh, the stock card and um, the forecasting card. Uh, face down in front of them only they have information as to what it is that's a little bit of insider information that they have but they don't know what the other players have and then one one and one of those cards are going to be put face up on the board now if you're playing with less than 
uh, the maximum amount of players, then you may also have cards off to the side. You're just going to keep branching out from there. So for instance, if we were playing with four players instead of five, each player would have uh, their set of cards. You'd have another set out here on the board face up and then another set off to the side uh, representing the cards that you don't know. Nobody knows what those are going to be. So one sock might behave way differently than you hope that it would, but you just don't know. So once you get done with the initial setup, everyone's got their money, everyone's got their board, everyone's got their initial shares of stock, then the game is going to begin. Whoever is the, uh, you'll randomly determine who the start player is, and they're going to get this uh, rather large start player piece, and this will pass every round, uh, like most things do. So after you do the information phase of everyone getting forecast cards, then you're going to go on to the supply phase where you're going to take one card at random from the top of the deck and put it underneath each one of the different uh, bidding spots face up. Then you're going to deal two, let's just say that just for simplicity's sake, this is going to be a three player game of this. Uh, then you're going to take two cards and give them randomly to each player. So each player has two cards in hand. Then starting with the start player, you are going to place those cards down onto the bidding stacks. But you're going to put one card face up and one card face down. You could put them on the same bidding stack if you want, but or you can mix them up and put them onto two different ones. It's up to you, but one card has to go face down, one card has to go face up. So for instance, I can say, okay, here's my hand. I have uh, leading laboratories and epic so I'm gonna go ahead let's see try to bluff up my opponent a bit and say that I uh, let's say that epic electric is really selling well and Stanford seal is just not selling all that well now in fact it might potentially go bankrupt um, in fact because it's well it let's say that here it's at the two it's you know that it's going to hit negative two so you know that's what's going to happen later so it's going to go bankrupt so put a, putting a card here might be a dumb thing if you actually want it but you might want to bluff out your opponents make it less appealing for your opponents to take that because of stanford steel and put a card that you really want there and hoping that you can get it for a low amount and then i'll have to put the leading laboratories card face up over here we'll just go ahead and split those up now each player is going to do this each player is going to get their two cards put them out one up one down any stacks that they want one or two stacks and again and when it gets around to the last player and they put out their cards then you move on to the demand phase this is where players are going to take turns again starting with the starting player of bidding for those these little calculators here are actually the bidding spots they go 0 1 3 6 10 15 20 and 25,000 the maximum bid is 25,000 if i really want this stack like my plan um, i might go ahead and just put it right here i could put on the zero spot and say well let's see if anyone outbids me maybe they don't want it that badly or if i want to continue my bluff maybe i'll even put it on another stack that i don't really want but that i know that one of my opponents might really want because they maybe they already have a lot of shares of that stock and they just want more or something to that effect and hope that they outbid me because when it comes around and someone else outbids me on the spot like so the red player outbids me here i take mine back and when it comes back to my turn i'm going to put it on another spot i can take the same spot again as long as i go higher and try to outbid them or i can put it on a brand new spot now once every player has uh, locked in on a different one of these bidding spots for a uh, one of these stacks of cards, then this phase is over and the players are going to take that stack of cards uh, and then flip over and they're able to see the cards that were face down in the stack. Now, there's a couple, you might say, well, okay, this seems pretty basic, but there's a couple of different types of cards you might run into during this phase. One of them is the trading fees card. If there's a trading fee card in the stack, you have to pay a fee simply for taking that stack. And sometimes your opponents will want to hide these in the stack face down, so you're not entirely sure that that's going to be coming up. Uh, and you have to reveal that, show it, and then uh, pay the fee, and then put the remaining stock that you were actually able to grab face down onto your board. Sometimes they're action cards, the stock boom and stock bust. And when you take one of these, these are actually beneficial for you because you are now able to control in the next phase uh, what stock goes up and what stock goes down. Let's say I get the stock bus card. I must play it right away. and I decide, you know what? You just got a bunch of purple cards. I'm making that less expensive. So now you're going to get less for your stock if you choose to sell it. Or and then if I say, well, I got my electric card. I'm going to go ahead and increase that by two with my stock boom card if I was able to get that card. So it's another little wrinkle in the mix. 
And after that action phase, then players are going to move on to the selling phases where you have a chance to sell your stock. You can sell it for whatever the price is um, that where the marker is on each particular type of stock. If it's a split stock, you get double the price if you choose to sell it then, but you are not compelled to sell any kind of stock. You want to look at the cards, the forecast cards that you have, knowing how the stock is going to move, see the one that's already out there, and try to guess what your opponent's forecast cards are, the information that they have based on the different types of cards they were trying to take, and then decide whether you sell or not. If you sell, you put the cards in the discard pile, take the appropriate amount of money, then you move on to the movement phase. The movement phase is where everyone reveals their forecast cards, and then you actually move the tickers up and bent down depending on how they're going to go. So now you know Stanford Steel is going to go down, and oh, look at that, it bankrupts. Everyone has to get rid of all their stuff. My card was that American Automotive goes up by two, so there you go, and so on and so forth. So that was actually really stupid that I didn't go for that card, but okay, this is just an example. Uh, so once you get done with the movement phase, uh, oh, one more thing. One of the cards is, I don't know where they are. Here you go, I got it, the uh, dividend card. If the dividend card is associated with one of the stock cards, then it neither goes up or down, but every player who has shares of stock in the company that is paying out dividends is going to get $2,000 or $4,000 if it's a split stock. Once you've resolved the movement phase, then the round tracker is going to move and essentially you're going to do this all over again. And you go back to the beginning of the round, you're gonna take back all the forecast cards, redeal them out, and then begin again. Once you've gotten to the last round, you're gonna play out the, the last round the same as you ever uh, would for the other rounds of the play, but at the end of the game, a couple of things happen. First off, you see who is the, major the majority stakeholder for each of the different companies. If you held on to some of your stock instead of selling it all prior to this round, you have the, or selling it uh, right in the final round, you have the potential to become a majority stockholder. So if I have the most Stanford Seal cards at the end of the game, I didn't sell them, I held on to them, and I have the most of those, then I'm actually going to get a $10,000 bonus uh, for being a single majority owner, or if I'm tied with uh, one or more players, then I'm going to get 5000 And I can do this for multiple companies if I held on to a lot of stock. After that, anyways, you're going to get to sell all of your stock for full value. So scratch what I said. You're, you're not going to sell before you get to that point. But uh, after once you determine majority, sell all your stock anyways, get its full value. Then at that point, whoever has the most money is going to be the winner of the game. Actually, I take that back. You might sell, I don't know why I'm like strategizing with myself, you might sell before it gets to the final part of the game and before you do the movement phase because if you know that the stock's gonna go in the toilet anyways, it might be better for you to sell even if it means you won't, you'll be missing out on the chance to get majority stakeholder just because you sell before it either potentially goes bankrupt or you just get more money for it. Okay, fine. That's a chance that you would do that. But that is, in a nutshell, the normal game of Stockpile. Let me go ahead and describe a couple of variants. All right, so the last thing I want to show you is just some variants or expansions, however you want to say it, uh, that come for the game that you can use optionally instead of the normal rules for Stockpile. So the board is actually double-sided. This is the normal side. On the other side, you have the advanced side. And as you can see, the values of the stocks vary wildly. So the stocks can now go bankrupt or split much sooner um, in, in different, at different time intervals than on the other side of the board. In addition to that, one of the stocks, Stanford Steel, does something really crazy, which is that uh, at certain points during the course of um, the game, whenever the Stanford Steel indicator uh, goes up in a positive direction on or past one of the numbers that has the little dollar sign on it, you gain dividends right then and there, $1,000. And of course that doubles if it's a split stock, in addition to any normal dividends you might get if the dividend card is out there for that particular stock. So as one way that it can drastically alter the game. And the other major variant is the investor cards. The investor cards are basically character special powers that you'll, uh, each player is going to get at the start of the game. It will adjust your starting money either up or down depending on the power of your ability. And also these investor cards are uh, very, they're not trying very hard to hide the fact that they are based off of famous rich people. So you have Billionaire Bill who has no special ability but starts off with much, much more money than the other players. You have Broker Bernie who the uh, trading fees for him 
turn into trading bonuses instead. But in exchange for that, he only starts off with 16,000. You have Discount Donald and uh, Dividend Deborah. I'm not actually sure who she's supposed to be. Um, you have Golden Graham who gets an extra thousand when he sells stocks. Uh, Maverick Marketing is Mark Cuban. May know Martha, who uh, much more attractive than uh, the actual Martha Stewart, uh, just in my personal opinion. Uh, and she gets to actually look at another player's uh, forecast cards once per round. And I don't know who Secretive Stewart is. Wise Warren is going to get to look at, Warren Buffett, of course, is going to get to look at, uh, a, during the demand phase, look at a stack of cards, look at all the hidden cards in one of the stacks. And then Crazy Kramer is going to get to adjust a stock uh, up or down, just one stock, or, maybe, or perhaps it's one, uh, one stock up and one stock down uh, before he goes to uh, sell stocks during uh, each round. So that's just some of the variants you can possibly use in Stockpile. Now, let's get to my final thoughts. I really love the artwork of Stockpile, although if you don't play with the investors, you may not actually see much of it outside of the front of the box. I kind of wish that art was everywhere all over the game like more people in all the artwork uh <laughs> i know that really wouldn't work very well for like the stock cards but it's really really fantastic art and the rest of the graphic design is really solid too um the physical components are fine the only thing i would complain about is the board the board is very odd because it does not lay out right there's something wrong with the hinge on uh when you fold the board and when you try to put it out it doesn't sit right if it's on uh, depending on which side of the board you're using, the advanced or the basic side, it's either going to be uh, up at the edges, like sitting slightly up off the table, or it's just going to be a big lump in the middle sitting off the table. So I wish that was a little bit better, but it doesn't really hurt the game that much. It's just it's more of a convenience and cosmetic thing. Um, as far as the mechanics of the game, here's the thing. The thing with Stockpile is it's, it is simple. It's more simple than you would think when you first see all the stuff. You see the stock tickers, and you're like, and like I said in my intro, the immediate assumption is, oh, a game about stocks. I mean, that's either going to really appeal to you or it's really not. But the game is so accessible. There is a lot of strategy to be had, or a surprising amount of strategy, and some push your luck elements at the same time. But it's in a package that is very easy to figure out. You'll have this game up and running in five to 10 minutes, I swear. It's that simple to learn. And it's fast too. This um, The box says 45 minutes. I actually think that's one of the most accurate things I've seen on a board game in quite a while, depending on the number of players. I think with more players, it's more chaotic and it's gonna take more time, obviously more people thinking. But let's say a three player game, which is one of the instances I played this game with three and four players. I haven't played it with two, which is slightly different. Um, but with three or four players, yeah, 45 minutes to an hour, totally possible. And because of that, and because of how easy the game to learn is to learn, it feels pretty exciting. It feels like you're always involved and it makes the game more interesting than what the theme would lend you to believe. I like the whole aspect of the little bit of bluffing that you can do during the, uh, the the demand phase, I always get the names of the phases wrong, uh, where you're putting out cards and trying to say like, well, I'm gonna put this one here. I really want this card, but I'll put it with some garbage and hope that no one tries to outbid me for it. Um, and trying to keep your bids as low as possible because money is victory points. So you definitely wanna hold on to that, but how much profit are you gonna make if you go all out and try to get those cards anyways? Are people gonna fall for your bluff and maybe you end up bidding zero or a thousand on a lot of cards? And trying to uh, figure out wh what cards to go for and that whole, the whole push your luck aspect of the forecast cards and all right, if I hold on to this stock, it might split this round, but it's also possible it'll drop three <laughs> because I don't know. And what if someone hits it with one of those uh, boost cards that that goes down? Or the bust cards, I guess it is. Then what am I gonna do then? This might be garbage. And do I hold on to this card now, knowing that there's a possibility it'll go bankrupt and it's just gone? But is $2,000 really gonna be that significant? What if I hold on to it and it goes up four? What if I get dividends on it? That kind of thing, that push your luck aspect, it seems random and chaotic, and I felt that more with four players, and I probably would had I played it with five, it would be even worse than that. 
But for three players at least, it didn't feel that way. It felt like a, just the perfect right amount of push your luck and bluffing. And like when you just make that big play and you hold on to your stock and you flip over one of those hidden forecast cards and it's like oh, plus four, yes! And I split my stock and I just made a ton of money. <coughs> In that regard, it actually feels very thematic because it feels like the stock market. The stock market is gambling. I don't like Per, I don't personally like uh, doing stocks or people that indulge in the stock market too much. I, I really feel like, for instance, CNBC is the gambling channel. I've heard it described that and that's really what it is. And the whole purpose of, I'm not trying to get on the rant here, but the whole purpose of stocks is to just turn money into more money. That's all that that does. It's not like a product or a resource or any kind of good for society. But I can understand why people would be intrigued and excited about it. And I think that in a, at least in a very small way, you can feel that in this game. And it's in a package that looks good and plays well and is smooth. I like trying to manipulate those different stocks and you know trying to figure out how they're gonna work in the bidding. All of it works together very well. I was really, really pleasantly surprised by this game. Now, as far as the variants go, um, I could take or leave using the alternate side of the board. I think the game is interesting enough without adding that little bit of fiddliness, fiddliness to it, like of everything working uh, differently, all the different socks interacting differently, although sometimes I guess I would use it. What's better is the investor cards. I would probably always play with the investor cards because I just love the idea of everyone having something different. You can feel very, very similar to all the other players just trying to acquire money in the normal game, but when you have a special power, that really can make or break some other games. I think the game is fine without them in this case, but it doesn't hurt. It adds more to it, and they're funny. They're funny that you know you can be these people who are clearly based off of famous people. They barely tried to hide that, if at all. Um, and the cards look good too. So overall, stockpile very, very good. I was pleasantly surprised by this game. It's probably going to be staying in my collection for quite a while because I don't have another game that fits this weight and I have no desire to play Acquire, which I guess is somewhat similar to it or any other kind of stock game. Um, this one works for me and works for my group. That is Acquire from Nauvoo Games. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.